Chapter 22 of Bizarre by Lawton McCall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nick Bulka. Holiday Misgivings. When, on Christmas night, I take a private view of the collection of presents I have received, I realize that I am a much misunderstood person. I sit down sadly and wonder what I could have done to create such an impression. Is there something queer about me? If so, then wouldn't it have been more tactful, more kind, to have come to me and told me of it, instead of thus brutally proclaiming it to the world? But that is the way people are. They will serenely assume things they wouldn't have the face to mention. Those morbid socks! half hose and half a disease the loom that made them must have been degenerate it is plain they were never intended to be put on because the pasteboard document that lurks in the bottom of the box declares they are guaranteed against any sort of wear and these were esteemed suitable associates for my feet i have no recollection of sniffling in public Yet here are nine dozen handkerchiefs, an outfit for someone with chronic coryza. As for the assemblage of pocketbooks, purses, wallets, coin holders, etc., I only hope that after I have paid my holiday bills, there will be enough money left to halfway fill the pocketbook I have already. But the crowd that seems most oppressive is that of the calendars. Am I really so absent-minding as to require seven engagement pads? Am I so lax about settling my accounts that my butcher and grocer and milkman feel called upon to supply me the means of knowing what day of the month it is? Anything may pass for a calendar, so long as it complies with the law by having a little batch of months attached to the bottom like an appendix. A snapshot of Cousin Gertrude's baby, Oh, the deuce! I suppose I was expected to give that kid something for Christmas. A pastoral chromo, entitled Shearing the Lambs, sent me by a firm of brokers. A picture of a child in a nighty saying its prayers, with the compliments of the Schweinler Beef Packing Company. A hand-tinted but feebly glued print of Paul and Virginia, inscribed Jones and Bergfeldt, plumbers. One calendar, consisting of a sheaf of large placards, each purporting to exhibit a specimen of female beauty, is so throttled by its silken cord that when February 1st arrives and I attempt to give one of those beauties the flop over, in order that I may gaze on the next one for a while, the situation proves too tense. The eyelet suddenly splits into an outlet and the jilted maiden, cast off by her sisters, collapses upon the floor. All of which is most distressing. But no more so than the notion that women seem to have of what a man likes. I shall never forget the pair of slippers that Aunt Josephine bestowed upon me last year. They were what are technically known as mules, but in reality they were a couple of long rafts, each with an arching toe cabin that would have accommodated both feet. The low racing sterns extended so far after my heels that the latter stood almost amidships. Navigation was difficult. They kept running afoul of each other, so that I would suddenly find my starboard foot partly on the port slipper and mostly on the floor. Sometimes one of them would dart ahead several lengths and capsize, obliging me to turn skipper. No matter how earnestly I lifted their bows, their sterns always dragged. A landsman would have said that my progress resembled pumping a rhapsody on a pianola, or skiing in the Alps. The unreasonableness of these mules reached a climax one morning while I was visiting the Chalmondley Browdens. I encountered my hostess unexpectedly as I was returning from my bath. In the excitement of the moment, 
both slippers bolted, one of them performing a spectacular flip-flap, and the other skidding through the balustrade of the stairway and landing below in a globe of goldfish, while I made my escape in a state of pedal nudity. As for the neckties I have received, truly, love is blind. End of chapter 22